Let's talk about story structure in video games. Most video games have terrible story structure because it is not a priority. Every other part of the narrative matters more at the moment. For example, your character designs matter more than your story structure. How compelling are your fundamental concepts? More important than your story structure. Your cutscenes, they look good, good audio, good music, good voice acting, good editing, all more important than your story structure. This is borne out by games that win storytelling awards. Final Fantasy XIV, awesome MMO story, best in the world, right? Well, I mean, it's good at the other things, the other things I mentioned, but its story structure is literally incoherent. Because it doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter, why am I trying to teach it? Well, this is the one thing that an indie studio can do better than a AAA studio. The dev cycle of a multi-million dollar game is going to be brutal when it comes to trying to create a coherent story structure. Things are constantly changing. Somebody's going to fall in love with a character, or it's going to be a mandate that you need to make this other character, that character, or whatever. You're not going to be able to create a very good story structure in those sorts of situations, which is why Final Fantasy XIV has such a terrible story structure, because it's made by hundreds of people over the course of a decade. Obviously, it's not going to hold together very well structurally. And this is the reason why storytelling structure is generally not put very high up in anybody's lists of what matters, because AAA studios only want the things that they can do well to matter, and they can't do story structure. Their dev cycle doesn't allow it. But yours does. As an indie studio, as maybe a solo dev or a small team, you have a small game that you're putting together, and your story structure isn't going to be beholden to any outside influences. You can just sit down and work out what works. You can have a better story structure than a AAA game just by spending an afternoon on it. So this is something I think is important. You won't be able to match a AAA studio for graphics uh, or music or voice acting or editing you might be able to get close if you spend all of your effort on it, but you're never going to outmatch them. But you can easily outmatch them by having a story that makes sense. Huzzah! That's why I'm trying to teach it. Now, I'm not some arbiter of truth. My opinions here are, I would consider them pretty normal. I don't think that I'll be shocking anybody with any of the things I'm going to say. If you've ever taken a story structure course for, say, creative writing, you're probably going to find the same things there as here. But I just want you to know that um, this is just my take. You don't have to consider it to be some ultimate truth. That said, let's talk a little bit about how to structure your video game story by sitting down and thinking about it for an afternoon. <laughs> Even if you're 12, you already know a lot about story structure because we talk about it all the time. For example, character arc. That's a story structure. Chekhov's gun. That's a story structure. The hero's journey. That's a story structure. All of these try and accomplish the same basic thing. They're trying to create an emotional through line. The whole point is that instead of having a hundred different little pieces that all stand on their own, we want all of those pieces to build up a core emotional resonance. They fit together in a way that the player acknowledges and builds on. I'll give you an easy example. You're putting together some space adventure, uh, and you put in some characters, and one of the characters is extremely annoying. And in your head you're like, oh, this character, I'm going to actually make them the evil villain mastermind at the end. It's going to be great. But everybody hates this character. They're like, why did you put Jar Jar in this movie? He's the worst thing I've ever seen. What the hell is wrong with you? And you're like, oh, I can't tell them. I can't tell them about the arc that he's going to go through. I can't tell them these secretly Darth Jar Jar. Because that would ruin the surprise. But they all hate Jar Jar so much that you just quietly shuffle him off into the background and give up. On the other hand, if you make it clear that Jar Jar is part of an arc, or whatever your annoying character is, I'm using Jar Jar as an example, then rather than view that character as 
just plain old annoying, they understand that he's annoying within the context of the arc. And they say, oh, this character sure has a lot of room to grow. I wonder how they're going to grow. I wonder how that's going to connect to the rest of the world. I wonder how that's going to proceed. And all of the various scenes that happen on this arc all get bundled together into one emotional context. They build on each other. In the middle of this arc, you'll be able to look back and look forward at the same time and see all of the things that have happened and all the things that might happen. You'll feel that connectivity the whole way through. And at the end, you can look back and you can say, look at all of the things that happened. That's an emotional through line. It creates emotional context for every scene on the arc, and every scene on the arc builds on everything that came before and hints at everything that might come next. This turns a character that everybody hates into a character that everybody looks forward to seeing grow. It's the difference between a comic relief character and a character arc. And all of the things I brought up do this. So the Chekhov's gun is the same thing. You introduce the Chekhov's gun and the, character, the player looks forward to how that, ga that gun is going to go off, how that gonna, gun is gonna influence the rest of the story. When it does go off, they look back and they say, oh look, it was all connected. And it's the same with the hero's journey and any other sort of formula. Uh, if you look up how to write a story tell, you know, how to write a, a script for a movie and it's like, on page six, do this. On page 12, do this. On page 40, do this. It's all the same basic stuff. These people found a formula that they think works. It's a set of story structures that they think allows the audience to follow along and create emotional context within the story. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, maybe they're right in certain contexts and wrong in others. But the whole point is they have a story structure and they're trying to make it so that the audience's attention flows well. Their emotion grows, all of the scenes connect. I don't know if there is some sort of awesome, perfect, fundamental story structure for video games. I, I honestly have no idea. But I can tell you a little bit about the basic principles on which these very simple tools work. And that means that you can assemble them. You can put them together in a way that works. So let's talk about the most basic one, an arc. The reason an arc is such a good fundamental story structure is because it has a flow to it. Things are changing in a way that is predictable. Not necessarily pre-scripted, it's not like boring, but you know how things are going to evolve. For example, let's say that you're trying to free a kingdom from the witch's influence. The witch has taken over the kingdom and has made everybody in the kingdom uh, follow her mental commands you immediately understand what this arc is going to do. You're going to have to unseat the queen, or the witch rather, and you're going to have to try and find a way to do it without killing off all of her thralls. Because the whole point is that you want them free, not dead. So this creates an arc that you're looking forward to seeing. You're like, oh, I wonder how we're going to do that. I can't wait to see how this arc will go. And at the end, you look back on all of the things that have happened, and you're like, wow, look at all of that stuff we did. Remember when Joe did that thing and when we finally freed Sue Ann and whatever? This is why arcs are one of the most powerful tools. And aside from things like check off guns, I would say that 99% of your tools when it comes to story structure in video games are just going to be arcs. You're just going to be looking at all of the things you're putting into your game and you're going to be saying, well, how does this change over time in a way that makes sense to the player? How does this character grow? How does this kingdom get freed? How does this sword turn into a super magic Uber sword? How does the character's father, their influence change? All of these things can be made into arcs. Not all of them have to be, but you should at least consider that. Because every single arc is a way to allow the player to look at a trajectory. They see that things are going to change and they're looking forward to where it's going to land. Now, the other thing to keep in mind about an arc, and, well, any structure really, is that at some point the structure stops. There is a point where it is done. Over here. This is the most powerful moment of the arc, because it contains all of the scenes of the arc. 
there's no more arc after this. So everything that has happened before is the totality of the arc. And it's all crushing down into this one little black hole of meaning. The bigger and more powerful the arc, the more emotions get gathered into this black hole. So this is the emotional core of the arc right here at the end. This is when the player cares the most because everything that happened before built up to this. This is when you have to decide what you're going to do with this bundle of energy. You have to put it somewhere. You have to do something with it. I mean, obviously, you could just end the game. You could be like, oh, well, you beat the boss. Hooray, that was the arc. But you have hundreds of arcs or dozens of arcs, and you're not going to want to have all of them just end the game when they end. Generally speaking, you're going to be taking all of this energy and moving it into another arc. Let me give you an example. Here is the world of witches or whatever, and basically uh, it's going to explode soon. It's got too much magic in it, and it's going to just blow up. So you need to go through each of the kingdoms and, you know, off the witch in charge or whatever. You need, need to do something about that. There's five kingdoms, and each one of them has an arc uh, that you have to go through in order to free them and fight off the super magic that's going to blow up the world. How do you arrange these arcs? Is it sequential? Do you solve Kingdom A, then Kingdom B, then Kingdom C, then Kingdom D, then Kingdom E? Do you interweave them? So it's a little bit of A, then a little bit of B, then a little bit of A, then a little bit of C? Well, what matters most is this part here. What do you do with the emotional core of these scenes? So... There are a couple of options, but in general, what you're going to want to do is push them straight into the next arc and make them part of the next arc so that that next arc inherits all of that power. So when you finish off Kingdom A, you're going to want that to happen somewhere, you know, nearish the end of the next arc for Kingdom B. And that means that you're going to have to set up some stuff for Kingdom B before Kingdom A is done. So yes, you are going to have to interweave them. By the time Kingdom A is done, you're going to want to have enough of Kingdom B ready so that you can dump all of the power, the emotional power of Kingdom A into Kingdom B. And of course, this is also true of characters. So Here's a classic example. Ah, oh, here's the evil boss. The evil boss has shown up and they're going to blow up the world. Oh no, what are we going to do? Uh, well, we're going to send away the hero. The hero is just not here. They died. They were sent to Hephil. And uh, they're running along Snake Road. They're growing as a character. They're training with Kami or whatever, right? And here's all the... We're fighting, we're fighting, we're fighting, we're losing. Oh my gosh, all of the B-tier characters are just getting their butts kicked. Oh, well, here comes the, the lead character... Boom, his arc is done. He's completed his training arc. He's back. And he gets shunted into the main boss arc near the end. And his character growth is complete. He comes back. He's like, I trained for decades with uh, Master Kami just for this moment. Get ready. And then that adds all of that emotional power into that final moment where he comes back and defe defeats this boss character that everybody else was getting their butt kicked by. This is an extremely common approach to storytelling and to story structure. You take all of the energy from an arc and you dump it into the next arc, which means that you normally have several arcs running concurrently so that you can do that. Let me give you another example. Uh, well, let me give you the same example. <laughs> that magic world that you're trying to keep from blowing up. It's got those five kingdoms, and you've arranged it so that the five kingdoms are, you know, chained into each other in a satisfying way. But there's also, like, a super final boss over here somewhere. Here. And this super final boss has to have all of the emotional power that you possibly can. So what do you do? Well, you draw on all these same arcs again. You just call back to them. Oh, look, Kingdom A! Uh, you freed them from the evil witch, and now they've shown up with their with their anti-mind control helmets to hand out to the rest of the crew. Here's Kingdom B. 
oh, they showed up to show their support with their engineering power, and here's Kingdom C, they've got that anti-undead thing going, and here's Kingdom D, everybody comes in to help save the day. Now, exactly how this work will depend on exactly how you want to write it. It could be that each of these kingdoms has their own beat in this final arc, or it could be that they all come in at the same moment as a giant rush of support when the hero feels lowest as part of the hero's arc. Yeah, because this is not the only thing happening here. We got the hero coming in too. So the hero arc comes down here. We know that the hero is going to finish their growth right before the final fight, or even during the final fight, right? That's going to be the moment when the hero's arc finally reaches its apex and gets shunted into fighting this villain. Alternately, it could go the other way, and the hero could be the point. But we'll do it this way. So maybe what happens is, in order to make sure that this works out, these kingdoms actually support the hero rather than that final fight. These are the sorts of considerations that you can go into once you understand how this structure works. This is how arcs work. They funnel into each other and you can call back to them, you can build on them, you can create emotional context for whatever you're doing. This is a story structure. This is how story structures work, according to me. Now, there are lots of other things you can do too, like Chekhov's guns and stuff, but for emotional power, an arc is probably your best bet because it has an arc. The player can see the trajectory and look forward to it, which means that calling forward and calling back is going to be extremely powerful. But, unfortunately, your boss just came in and said, uh, you know, our, uh, our season pass DLC that's coming out in three months is actually going to be about pan-dimensional ghosts, so you need to change the story um, uh, to be about a pan-dimensional ghost. A pan-dimensional ghost did it. That's the story now. You can you can make it whatever arc you want, but it needs to be pan dimensional ghosts did it so that they people 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 want to feel mad about the pan dimensional ghosts in the next upcoming DLC. Where the heck are you gonna put pan dimensional ghosts? Oh, is this the fault of a pan dimensional ghost? What are you gonna do over here after you fought the final boss? You're gonna say, oh, but it was actually a pan dimensional ghost doing it the whole time. Mwahaha! ha ha! I was defeated just as I had planned. Now it's time to fight me for real. This, this energy isn't going there. The, the, this is not an arc that is underway, so the energy can't get in. That would be boring. Anything that happens after this final beat, you know, you could put in, like, vacations or side quests or whatever, but you can't put in, like, the true ending. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have any of the emotional power. So if you want to have that pan-dimensional ghost arc, you've got to put it in somewhere else, like, I don't know, here? You gotta jam it in, you gotta find a place for it. This is the reason why an indie studio can have a better story structure than a AAA studio. Your story can be figured out more or less ahead of time. And you can understand how these things are gonna flow together by sitting down and thinking where your emotional beats happen, what you can draw on to add more emotional power, and where your emotional power can flow into once you reach the crux. This is how I think about story structure, and obviously it's very basic. There's no frills here. You just take everything that the player could conceivably care about and think about whether you want to make them care about it. If you do, you make an arc. That lets them look forward, it lets them look back, and it lets them have one final massive burst of energy that you can shunt into another arc. basic stuff. I hope this was helpful, um, and if uh, you have other ideas, feel free to leave them down below. Bye!